Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be reading from The Christian Archetype, a Jungian Commentary on the Life of Christ by Edward F. Edinger, published by Inner City Books. Today I'm reading from Chapter 4, which is entitled Baptism. In The Development of Personality, Volume 17 of the Collected Works of C.G. Jung, Dr. Jung has this quote, What is it in the end that induces a man to go his own way and to rise out of unconscious identity with the mass? It is what is commonly called vocation, which acts like a law of God from which there is no escape. Anyone with a vocation hears the voice of the inner man. He is called. And that was from paragraph 299 of volume 17 of the Collected Works of C.G. Young. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew three thirteen to 17 The baptism of Christ represents an initiation ordeal of salutio, a death and rebirth drama in which the ego encounters its transpersonal destiny and commits itself to it. For the Church, it is the prototype of the sacrament of baptism, which signifies the death of the old life of the flesh and rebirth into the eternal life of Christ. As Paul puts it, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4. His baptism by John indicates that Christ was initially a follower of John the Baptist. He submitted himself to immersion in the unconscious under the guidance of another. This was followed by an experience of the autonomous psyche, the descent of the Holy Spirit. Something similar may happen when an analysand submits to the transference. What begins as personal dependence and projection may lead to one's unique encounter with the objective psyche. Christ's willingness to submit to baptism by John is explained in the enigmatic phrase, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. I take this to mean that it is just and right initially to submit oneself to the outer authority of another in preparation for the experience of the transpersonal other within. One needs a psychological apprenticeship, figure nine. This is an image that is attributed to Rembrandt. It's a drawing of the baptism. According to the docetist heresy, the divine Christ nature descended on the man Jesus at his baptism and proceeded to use him as its instrument. Thus, according to Arrhenius, the Gnostics spoke of two baptisms, quote, They maintain that those who have attained a perfect knowledge must of necessity be regenerated into that power which is above all, for it is otherwise impossible to find admittance within the pleroma, since this regeneration it is which leads them down into the depths of Bithus. For the baptism instituted by the visible Jesus was for the remission of sins, but the redemption brought in by that Christ who descended upon him was for perfection, and they allege that the former is animal, but the latter is spiritual. 
and the baptism of John was proclaimed with a view to repentance. But the redemption by Jesus was brought in for the sake of perfection. And to this he refers when he says, quote, And I have another baptism to be baptized with, and I hasten eagerly towards it. Luke twelve thirty. Unquote. The two baptisms correspond psychologically to the baptism of confession, repentance, administered by another and the baptism of the autonomous psyche in which the individual becomes aware that he must answer to the self. Thus John the Baptist says, quote, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Matthew three eleven. Several ancient texts mention the presence of fire over the Jordan at the time of Christ's baptism. Justin says, when Jesus had gone to the river Jordan where John was baptizing, and when he had stepped into the water, a fire was kindled in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, the Holy Ghost lighted on him like a dove. The translator says in a note, the Shechinah, probably attended the descent of the Holy Spirit. However, Danielu puts a different twist on it. Quote, In this tradition, the fire appears to be an allusion to the destructive fire of judgment, and a number of texts mention it. The following instance occurs in the Sibylline Oracles. After the Son of God was received a second birth according to the flesh, being washed in the blue, sluggish stream of Jordan. When he was escaped the fire, he will be the first to see a God coming with good favor by means of the spirit on the wings of a white dove. The text certainly seems to suggest that Christ was delivered from the fire by baptism, and that it was then that the spirit descended a view quite in line with the text of Justin, in which the fire appears over the water at the moment when Christ goes down into the Jordan. The idea of Christ's having been delivered at his baptism from the fire appears elsewhere in the oracles, in a passage which speaks of, quote, the Father who has spread abroad thy baptism in pure water, at which thou, the word, didst appear, coming out of the fire, volume 7, 83 to 84. The same conception occurs in the excerpta ex Theodata by Clement. Clement, giving an account of the teaching of this disciple of Valentius, writes, quote, Just as the birth of the Savior delivered us from the flux of becoming and from fate, so also his baptism rescued us from the fire, and his passion rescued us from passion. Unquote. Other texts speak of a great light. Understood psychologically, these references indicate that the light and fire of the Shechina, Yahweh's glory, the fire of the last judgment, and the dove of the descending Holy Ghost are all aspects of the same phenomenon namely the manifestation of the autonomous psyche. In addition to fire and light, the baptism is accompanied by a voice. The authoritative voice appears occasionally in dreams and calls for the utmost respect. In this case, it announces, quote, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, unquote. This statement corresponds to a similar one in Isaiah 42.1, which proclaims the servant of Yahweh, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. It conveys the message that the ego, as it accepts its vocation and destiny, has the love and support of the self. In Psalm 74, 13, we read, quote, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters, unquote. 
Cyril of Jerusalem applied this text to Christ's baptism. Quote, Since, therefore, it was necessary to break the heads of the dragon in pieces, he went down and bound the strong ones in the water. Unquote. Daniello notes that the theme of the dragon hidden in the waters of death and of Christ's baptism is a descent into the dragon's domain was to endure in tradition. From this follows the remarkable idea that Christ's baptism brought about a cleansing of water by destroying the demonic forces that dwell in it. Ignatius writes, quote, he was born and baptized that by his passion he might purify the water, unquote. And Clement of Alexandria says, quote, the Lord had himself baptized, not that he had need of it for himself, but so that he might sanctify all water for those that are regenerated in it. In this way, not only are our bodies cleansed, but our souls also. And the sanctification of the invisible parts of our being is signified by the fact that even the impure spirits which cleave to our soul are rooted out from the time of the new spiritual birth, unquote. The idea of cleansing and sanctification of water suggests the transformation of the unconscious itself. What had once been the abode of demons, autonomous complexes that threaten to possess the ego, may, through increasing consciousness, be expressed as the sacred transpersonal ground of being. Christ's baptism signifies his encounter with destiny. It is simultaneously an act of commitment and a passive anointing by John and by the Holy Spirit. In the psychology of individuation, destiny and identity are the same, expressed by the twin questions, what am I and who am I? John the Baptist, as the forerunner who prepares a way for the Lord, Matthew 3.3, 3, is the bringer of this question. While imprisoned by Herod, he sent to Christ this question, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Matthew 11, 3. Christ's answer is a model of canniness. Quote, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Matthew 11, 4, and 5. This answer avoids explicit identification with the self while acknowledging its presence by reference to its effects, namely insight, perception, healing, and renewed vitality. Are you the one? is the crucial question of individuation. Once it is asked, the die is cast, and the process must live itself out for good or ill. The Gnostics attempted to engage this question and answered it in their famous formula, quote, what liberates is the knowledge of who we were, what we became, where we were, where into we have been thrown, where to we speed, wherefrom we are redeemed, what birth is and what rebirth, unquote. Immediately following the baptism, we read, quote, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, Matthew 4, 1. This sequence refers to the danger of inflation that accompanies an encounter with the self. The Holy Spirit that blessed Christ turns diabolical and becomes the tempter. This image expresses the ego's temptation to identify with the transpersonal energy and use it for the purposes of personal power. Quote, the story of the temptation clearly reveals the nature of the psychic power with which Jesus came into collision. It was the power-intoxicated devil of the prevailing Caesarean psychology that led him into dire temptation in the wilderness. 
this devil was the objective psyche that held all the peoples of the Roman Empire under its sway. And that is why it promised Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth, as if it were trying to make a Caesar of him. Obeying the inner call of his vocation, Jesus voluntarily exposed himself to the assaults of the imperialistic madness that filled everyone, conqueror and conquered alike. In this way, he recognized the nature of the objective psyche, which had plunged the whole world into misery and had begotten a yearning for salvation that found expression even in the pagan poets. Far from suppressing or allowing himself to be suppressed by this psychic onslaught, he let it act on him consciously and assimilated it. Thus was world-conquering Caesarism transformed into spiritual kingship and the Roman Empire into the universal kingdom of God that was not of this world. Unquote. Thank you.